All right, sorry everyone for the delay here. No problem. Working out new stuff here. All right. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Always something. Yep, that's life. Okay, here we go. My back's going to be to you, but um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this week's master class. As um, you've heard from me via um, our emails and and uh, my own talking to you, I'm really excited about this particular class. Um, as I said to the YCO, as much as I want you to practice, I want you to sound great. I want you to have great intonation and musicality. I most want you to be safe and free from harm and free from um, issues coming up because of your, your playing. And um, uh, we're very, very lucky that, that you know one of the world great violinists, um, she's not so lucky maybe, but she went through a lot of issues that she had to overcome. And she's willing with her husband, Howard, who is a physical therapist, willing to share this with us. And it's a great gift for all of us. So I want you to all um, join me and please welcome uh, Pamela Frank and Howard Young. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. That's very kind of you to say all those, very kind of you to say all those nice things. Um, yeah, I have to say that uh, it was in a way a gift to me to have been injured because I learned the hard way uh, uh, what would be better for everybody. And so as a result of that injury, Howard and I work together now and um, we started this venture called fit as a fiddle where we work together with musicians on preventing injury and treating injuries so um just a little bit of background i in 2012 got a career threatening injury to my neck i and i was told i needed surgery and uh i possibly would not play again and but then i my doctor said okay you don't go to you don't get surgery right away you go see howard nelson so I went three times a week to Howard Nelson and six months later, not only did I not have surgery, I was getting better and I started to pick up the violin again about a year later. And two years later, I was back to playing. Now it, it did take a long time, so that's the scary part. But the good news is that uh, I didn't have to have surgery. And ever since then, I've been in a much better, uh, I use my body much better. And I feel fortunate that I recovered thanks to Howard. So, uh, you know, I was such a good patient and he was such a good physical therapist that we eventually just had to get married. <laughs> and now we do this work together, which makes us both very happy. We feel like we can help people, especially young people like you guys. So I will turn it over to Howard now who will introduce himself and he'll start us. So I've been a uh, physical therapist since 1989, and uh, I now work at the Curtis Institute, where I, I see a lot of the uh, student musicians there. So now I'm going to share our screen here. This is a cautionary tale. As Mark said, as Mark said to me yesterday, we're, oops, sorry. Just one second. Share this. We don't want that. We don't need that. There we go. I just want to say, as Mark said to, to me, to us yesterday, this is good because we're preventing people from the horrors that Pam went through. <laughs> so here's the first horror that you can see. So this is a picture of Pam when she was five years old, uh, and then a picture at 45. And for my purposes, she looks a lot better at five years old. Uh, and, and she, the wear and tear took its toll on Pam. So she had this bad injury in 2012. So the, the main theme of this talk is that the way you use your body can be either beneficial or a potential cause of injury. So that, that's the major 
thought here. We all know what happens to a building. If it tilts too, too far for too long, the building's going to have a big problem, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Uh, people will too, but we have options. So Pam is very, very <laughs> tilted. This is in October 2012, uh, and this is a month before I first saw Pam with her injury. Um, I was injured uh, two weeks before this concert, and I powered through and played it anyway. So what makes the difference between Pam and the Leaning Tower is that she's a human being, and she has the, she has the option to not tilt if she doesn't want to. And so this is another uh, of, of a freeze frame from a video showing the worst uh, of Pam. <laughs> and her left arm is pinned to her body. Her head is way forward. The instrument is pointing down way too far. And in this picture, it looks like her setup might not be the best because she's hiking her shoulder quite a bit, which means it may, might not fit her properly. And this is a video clip from that same concert. And the sound is off because if you're ever gonna videotape yourself and look at your body to see what you're doing, you need to have the sound off so you can be objective about what you're doing. Uh, the other reason the sound is off, and here's the first warning to all of you, is that it actually sounded good. Now, I had been injured two weeks before and I ignored it. And by the time I got on stage this night, I could not feel my left arm at all. It was totally numb and my head, I couldn't turn my head. My neck was in so much pain. I was just frozen from pain. But the problem is that we can still play. So I played and it sounded good. So we left the sound off because um, you shouldn't hear an injured person sounding good. You should be <laughs> taking away the message that if you are injured, you should not be playing because we're not athletes and we should not be powering through. So here's the video. So what's wrong with this is she has a neck injury and she's not controlling her neck. Her neck is moving all over the place and she's expressing herself maybe too much with her head. So when I first saw her in November, 2012, she, this is what she drew on the picture in, in my office. Uh, her pain was down her arm and on the top of her left shoulder. And she could identify what it was, which was bending her head forward and to the left. So that's the first step in, in helping yourself is trying to identify or connect what you're doing with your symptoms. By the way, bending head forward and to the left is basically violin playing <laughs> so if you go too far yeah so i too had a neck problem and i wanted to uh show you the the great uh, positive use of cameras and your phone camera uh it can be used to to figure out what it is you're doing so i had neck pain so i put my iphone camera on a a, a tripod to my right to see what I was doing when I was working. And this is a real picture of me working. And then that was the correction I made to make it so that I didn't have pain. Um, so what you're doing all throughout your day is adds up and makes things either worse or better. Look how much shorter you are on the left. Yeah, so I'm shrunk in and I don't wanna be small either. So this is just some guy in Central Park in New York. Uh, I just took this picture, you know, secretively, and uh, he doesn't—he doesn't fit this table. So he is accommodating to the table. You really want to make the environment adapt to you, if possible. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, if he's a violinist uh, and he has his head forward when he's playing violin and he has his head forward when he's on the computer and has his head forward when he's doing exercises in the gym, these things add up and they, your body develops a problem from that. 
uh, our bodies adapt to how we use them. They actually change. So he's on his toes. Do any of you know where your feet are when you're playing? Are your toes on the ground or, your, or is your whole foot on the ground? So his calf muscles might be getting tight when he does this. Wouldn't you say that the feet should be planted on the ground when you're playing? I, I, ideally, they should be usually planted so you have a good base. So the, another theme of our talk is we get what we train for. What you do all day long is going to add up and your body changes because of that. So one thing that would have been helpful for that guy in Central Park was if he had his uh, laptop up on this little uh, support. And the thing, the thing he needs is a, a keyboard, though, because he's, he's putting his hands on the keyboard when it's up on the, on the device. But he really should be having his hands on a separate keyboard and a, and a separate mouse. This is really important because we know that everybody spends half their day on their computer or more. Right. And so we have... Uh, at the end, we have a uh, handout that you guys have received that has a link to a device like this, I believe. And what do you do on your breaks after you just finish playing? Like all, most of the people I, I work with tell me, oh, I go on my cell phone. <laughs> well, if, you, if your head is down when you're playing too much and then you go on your cell phone and you look down as far as these guys are, these, these are real pictures of real people. They didn't know I was taking their picture. And uh, <laughs> the guy on the left is, is, is really looking at his phone to avoid the sun. I actually, when Howard first showed this to me, I thought the guy on the left was crying. Like I thought he was grieving. <laughs> so this is pretty extreme and this is real. Yeah. Um, and then what do you do when you're uh, taking a rest and somebody else is playing or the teacher is talking? What you do during the rest is also important. So this violist had neck and shoulder pain on the left side. And this is the way he chose to sit. Um, and if you look at what's on his left side, you can see his cell phone is on the ground next to him. So if he has a back problem or feels uncomfortable and he keeps having to bend down to the ground to get his cell phone or his water, not good. So you wanna put your cell phone or water on a chair next to you or on a, a music stand next to you, but this is not good. But look what else is wrong with that picture. Like look at his left elbow, look at his toes, he's on his toes. Yep, yep. Everything is not in neutral, everything, right? Yeah. Uh, and this is a pianist that had forearm and wrist pain. And so I keep, you know, these are pictures and videos I'm taking. So I, I'm, this is really, this talk is about trying to capture what you're doing to see what it is, is the problem. So she asked me to, to look at her play. So I looked at her play and look at her wrist. <laughs> oh, I want to go back there. Her wrist is way bent, way too far. And then she said, well, when I'm not playing, this is what I put, do with my wrist. And that's not a restful position for the wrist. It's way too bent. So you can pick up these things when you see yourself on camera. Uh, and this is a cellist who had a uh, right shoulder problem, pain. And when he played his elbow, I'll do it on my left side, his elbow went above his shoulder. So that's a stressful position for your shoulder. You don't wanna to play too often with your elbow way up there. It's not the best place for the shoulder joint. So he had to train himself not to let his elbow go that high on certain notes. <laughs> and the treatment is very complicated. Uh, one of the treatments is... <laughs> try not to do that. The, thing, the things that make you worse, if you can figure that you out. Know, that's a, it sounds so simple, but it's actually really, really hard. But it's a, it's a good cue to everybody. I mean, because it's the, the, the first step is identifying what the problem is and then getting rid of the irritants. That's a big part of exactly. this. Exactly. So a varied lifestyle will help a lot. Um, people can do really lousy things with their bodies and be look like they're terrible. But if they're very active and they keep very fit, they can get away with that a lot more. So this is going to be, I, I, I you know, I, I recommend that you do some sort of physical activity. 
And if you can't do a sport, pure walking is fantastic. That means not walking your dog, not on your cell phone, not shopping, just purely moving your arms, letting yourself walk freely is, is fantastic. And not enough people do that, actually. So getting back to Pam, um, is there an ideal way to play your instrument? Well, she looks really good at 5 and 12 <laughs> because she looks like herself. She looks kind of normal, which means kind of close to neutral. Neutral is, you know, not in an exaggerated, tilted, rotated position. And that's the best I can come up with. There's no ideal one way to play. So what Howard used to always say to me when I first came to him is, look at yourself in the mirror with your head straight on. That's Pam. Now, if you add an instrument to that, it should still look like yourself. That's what he means by normal. You should look like yourself. You don't walk, you, you don't walk down the street with your head tilted to the left and looking forward. Right, right. So some things that'll help you stay closer to neutral. Uh, the music stand is one thing. Pam at five years old was incredibly smart. And she's, oh, I got to have a music stand at my right height. <laughs> but that, that's probably all she could do there. Uh, anyway, that's perfect because your head is looking straight ahead. And uh, she, come on. Yeah. No, no. Are you done? Yeah. Saying so um, Howard always says that the music stand should be at eye level. And at home, there is no reason not to have it as high as possible at eye level. We, we understand that in chamber music and in orchestra, it's a little bit different. Although in chamber music, I had to learn, I used to play with my stand really low because I thought that it would make me able to communicate with my chamber music partners better. But I had to learn because of my injury uh, to put my stand at eye level and to still be able to communicate. What I realized is that all this staring at each other doesn't necessarily make it sound better. In fact, you know, I love going to concerts and a chamber group is totally not together, but they're staring at each other, right? So the trick to being together and communicating is listening. So I had to learn the hard way to put my stand up and just listen more without staring at my colleagues. Um, in orchestra, Howard always says, you know, there's always a lot of twisting going on in orchestra. You have to accommodate you have to sort of uh, take care of your stand partner. And so we always say that the, the person, the tallest person in your on your stand wins this, the height of the stand contest. So that's the person that should have uh, the, the stand at eye level and try to avoid twisting. So take an average and put the stand in line with the conductor so that nobody's, is, people are staying as close to neutral as possible to see the conductor and the stand. Yeah. yeah. So in another example of making your environment adapt to you, unlike that guy in Central Park. <laughs> so this is a uh, violist who had left sided neck and shoulder pain. And um, he was the tallest guy in this quartet, but <laughs> he has the, the lowest music stand. I think you can see how low this is compared to his neighbors there. Um, so he's going to play and uh, <laughs> well, he had an injury, right? Yeah. That's what I said. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we'll watch him play here. <laughs> So what you don't see is that about two seconds later, he slipped off the chair and almost fell to the ground. That's uh, how far down he was going. So he obviously needs the music stand higher and he needs in his instrument higher as well. Uh, so for sitting in chairs, um, this is a, a picture of Nobuko Amai, who's a great uh, uh, violist. And Nobuko is having problems in her calf muscles. And she asked me to, to see what was going on. So I took a few pictures and 90% of the time she was on her toes. And the reason for that is that she's small. Well, one of the reasons she's small and she doesn't fit the chair. So her feet don't reach the ground. So the, the treatment is put your feet on the ground. And in order to do that, she needed to get this little half foam roller, which was very light and enabled her to sit to the back of the chair. And it took away the pain she had in her calves. So if you're too small, you really want to um, 
figure out how you can use still use the back of the chair. And if you don't have a foam roller, then just use books or, you know, something, a box, anything to, to uh, put on. In other words, get creative and don't just settle for a chair that doesn't fit you if you're too short. Or use a couch pillow or a big fluffy jacket in the back of your chair so that you're, you're, the back of the chair is closer uh, to you. So we really advocate, advocate for people using the back of the chair or the front of the chair. Either way can work. You don't want to be uh, have to only use one position, and uh, they they are both very good. Well, that was another thing that I had to learn and change by uh, being a patient of Howard's is that I used to sit on the front of the chair for the same reason as I had a low stand, which is that I thought that I could be more engaged, you know, more alert, more communicative with my um, colleagues on the front. And I know that we're all taught, you know, as children to like sit on the front of your chair, you know, that makes you more alert and all of that. But I had to learn to sit in the back of the chair because on the front of the chair, I was arching my back, which is a very common uh, thing to do when you're on the front of your chair. And that was affecting my neck adversely. So I learned to sit on the back of the chair. I also learned that a lot of chairs are too deep, you know, so besides being too high or too low, too deep is Howard already mentioned, just stuff some clothes uh, if it's too deep in between you and the chair, if you're too tall for a chair, add a couple of chairs, one or two chairs. In other words, there are no good chairs. It's like the ideal chair is a flat chair um, that is not too deep and it allows you to put your feet on the floor. But those chairs are really hard to find. So please don't settle for a bad chair because they're all bad and make it fit your body specifically. So back to Pam's case, one of the things I asked her to do is sit in the way that you feel comfortable. And that's like a movement test. And Pam chose to sit like this, which is very similar to the way she was playing her instrument. So it's familiar, but not helpful. Even though she was in pain when she did this, she chose to do it anyway. That's okay. So this is the way she sat for playing, and this is again, uh, October, 2012. And the question is, is her setup too low? Because she's, it looks like she's slunt, slouching down to meet the instrument. So that's one of the things we had to do in our rehab was figure out a better setup for Pam. So as you can see, she's looking in the distance here is Pam is on video in real time. So it's another case of using a camera. And uh, the setup was uh, experimented with by using towels at first to get the right height for Pam. Because as you can see, my shoulders are very sloped and I also have a long neck. So we were trying to get the instrument to come up to me. That was Howard's principle. So this is um, now October. Uh, and so she finally progressed to playing notes and in a mirror and she was looking, you know, her head is straight, not tilted. The instrument now fills in the space between her shoulder and her, and her jaw. And, um, and you want to say a few words? Yeah, well, so in addition to the shoulder rest, we have it on the next slide, but there was also the chin rest that need to, needed to be changed. But for any of you that are paying attention to the timeline, you know, I first, that the Library of Congress concert was October, 2012, okay? It's now a year later. So if this scares you, it should. It took me a year <laughs> to get back to just picking up the instrument to, to, play, to play a few notes. So it should scare you, but it should also encourage you because a lot of these things that we're talking about are prevention. You could prevent a problem from happening by following these principles that Howard's talking about. Uh, that's one thing. The next thing is that, so these are my first notes and they sound terrible. I cannot shift yet because I've played for 40 years one way. And for the last year, I've had to basically relearn how to play uh, as per Howard's directions. So just like we left the sound off for the concert in October, 2012, because it sounded good. I warn you, we left the sound on for this and it sounds awful. But the message is 
of course, it's going to sound awful when you're learning something new. Like if you learn a new fingering or a, or a new bowing or a new articulation or a new phrasing, it's going to not sound good. It's going to also not feel good, but have faith because I had to have faith. This was the right way for my body for the rest of my life. And so you, it's okay to sound bad when you're trying something new. Hopefully the sound works here. Uh -huh. So this is perfect for me because she, because she her, her, her shoulders stay level, her arms away from her body and her head was straight. So I, I gave her an A plus on that. Can I just say it felt terrible? I mean, besides the fact that it sounds terrible, it felt terrible, it felt awkward, uncomfortable, weird. Um, but that goes away. So the, the message here is that you can teach an old dog new tricks. Um, yeah. Because I yes. think I, I think they all want um, they they all want to sound like your bad days. So uh, oh. <laughs> that was the uh, ruffle in the room here. <laughs> That's very sweet of you guys, but really, my shifting was much better before this. I I promise you. <laughs> That's cute. So this is the uh, chin rest she uh, ended up with, and it adapted to her anatomy. That's the idea. The, make the environment adapt to you. Can I just say that, you know, I, I know, I don't know about all of you, but my whole life I've only talked about, uh, I've only experimented with different chin wrists, uh, sorry, with different shoulder wrists, height of the shoulder wrist, you know, and nobody ever mentioned a chin wrist. And so it took Howard, who is a brilliant non-musician who said to me, well, if the shoulder rest can be modified, can't the chin rest be modified? And it was like, duh, I never, I never thought of that. So, and the point was, is that, you know, an instrument comes with a chin rest, you don't even think about it, but your equipment absolutely has to adapt to your unique body. No two bodies are the same. Therefore, no two setups should be the same. The chin rest, he, he very scientifically took his fingers and put one finger on my jaw and the other on my uh, clavicle. And he said, well, that's a big distance. That distance needs to be filled in by the chin rest. More or less. More or less, so that you your head will not go down or to the left. And it just never occurred to me. So this changed my life really significantly. Um, and it didn't... Uh, require me to change the height of my shoulder rest. Uh, so that is something to consider when you're trying to fit your instrument to you. You have to actually look like yourself, as you can see I do, and there just happens to be an instrument there. So the change of chin rest was an enormous thing. And this is that uh, violist again, and this is the training that we did with him. And Pam had a great idea to lift up the music stand as an obstacle to his scroll. That's what you see uh, where the red arrow is. And here's him playing. <laughs> yeah, and you know, so when I was training with him and we did this together, uh, he would sometimes like be looking at his instrument or something else. And I said, you know, no, no, no. You have to look at yourself in the mirror. You have to see what it is you're doing if you want to train out of it. This is a great tool though, this stand thing, because it keeps your instrument horizontal. When your instrument is horizontal, your body is at its best it's, and the in instrument is also neutral and you're gonna get the more sound uh, with less effort uh, when it's at this height like this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is uh, another violist, I believe. Yeah. And, and uh, he was having problems in his right uh, top of his right shoulder. And uh, I said, okay, would you mind taking your shirt off? And uh, so I could see what, what you're possibly doing. And, and, you know, the bow weighs two about two ounces and uh, he's using a lot of muscle force. So, what, <laughs> so the message is uh, look for excess muscle tension. You don't want to use more than is necessary to play. You know, so that, that includes the left hand and the fingers pressing too hard on the on the strings. 
You only want to press hard enough to make the sound uh, that you want, but you don't want to go over that. Well, also, like, actually, you get more power from being relaxed. We all think that more power means more muscle. We got to muscle through if we want to play big and strong. It has nothing to do with that. You need to be actually relaxed. And I remember after Howard saw this guy, he said, do you really need a bicep like that to play the viola? You know, the, the bow weighs what? And he was right. like, how long, how long, how much does the bow weigh? You don't, you don't need muscles to hold the bow. 60 grams. I think. 60 grams. Yeah. So exercises, one of the principles is to do exercises that are the opposite from your playing muscles. So some ideas are, you know, your elbows are bent, your fingers are bent and your arms are down. So st straightening your arms up with your fingers is one idea. Oftentimes the head is forward. And so exercises that pull the head back is another idea. Learning how to bend from your hip joint instead of your spine is another idea. And we'll look at this in a second here. So Pam needed to strengthen the muscles that elevated her shoulder blades and arms which is in her middle upper back. That was a, a big thing she needed to change. So because it was so difficult, we started on the ground first lying on her back, just making her arms go overhead on her back without gravity. Then we added gravity, but used the wall to help her. So she lets her arms slide on the wall, lets her shoulder blades go up. This, how long did this take you to do? Oh, months. <laughs> this took maybe three or four months because from all that violin playing with my left arm pinned to my body, I could not get my left arm to raise above my head. And a lot of young people cannot do this. And um, so if you can't lift, if you lift, if you raise both your arms over your head and one of them doesn't go, uh, that is a warning sign that you need to be doing this much, much more. Because if I had been doing this from, from your age, I might not have gotten into such trouble. Yeah, you shouldn't have pain and it shouldn't feel very restrictive and stiff and tight. Yeah, it should be I, easy. Ide ideally. And so over time, Pam was able to do that. You see from the slouch position to the upright position is a, is a long way. And she, she was able to get there by doing these exercises. But yeah, it took me a long time, which is why if you guys can start thinking about this stuff now, it would save you a lot of time later and probably be a, a big preventive measure for you. Another idea was learning how to move from your hip joint, like I said, and which will counteract a head being too far forward. Um, and this is an example of a, uh, a violinist that had neck pain and some pain going down his arm. And uh, what he was doing when he was marking the score and, and, and sitting oftentimes in practice would be to slouch like that on the left side from his spine. And, uh, but he, he learned to move from his hip. The hip joint, if you can see my pointer here, the hip joint is about here. So that's where he's moving from. His spine is staying relatively straight and moving from the hip. So that's kind of what a squat is as well. It's, it's moving from the hip. So while you guys are sitting there watching this, you should try, <laughs> try some of this so that you don't get stuck in a position. You can tr easily yeah. try it. Yeah, that's, that's right. So the hip is way down six inches below your waist. That's where your hip joint is. Maybe we'll do this later if there's time. So the opposite of moving poorly is moving well. And Roger Federer is a great example of, uh, of moving well. And so we think if you move well, you're gonna minimize injury and, and improve performance. So Roger is a great example of, of being balanced and using the fewest muscles necessary. Yeah, I mean, it's also effortless. He doesn't sweat, he's not powering through, and he, he lasted the longest without injury. Yeah. of any tennis player. So he's our model. If we should, we could all play our instruments the way Roger Federer plays tennis would be in good shape. So this is Pam, uh, 2014. This is uh, a year and a half or so after the injury and um, almost two years, almost two years. And uh, okay. yeah. And this is at Verbier uh, playing her first concert back. So 
So I thought that she did a great job. Her head was straight. She moved her head about a little too much, but um, I froze it on this frame because her arm is away from her body and not her left arm is in pin to her body like it was before. And so I thought she was doing well. Um, so I feel two things about this this slide. One is that I'm really proud of myself that I didn't go back to my old ways because you guys all know that when you're stressed or nervous or under pressure, we all just go back to what is familiar, what we've done our whole lives, even if it's bad, right? We just go back to what we know the best. So I was proud of myself that except for the head shaking, I, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't crumble under the pressure. Now, why was there pressure? Well, First of all, um, in Verbier, everything gets live streamed. So you can't make a move without the world knowing about it. Number two, my colleagues and friends, they really meant well, but they made such a big deal about this is Pam Frank's return to playing. And I was like, I just want to play with my arms in the right place, with my head in the right place. I just want to play with a bag over my head and do the Howard principles and get off stage. That's all I wanted to do. So I felt a lot of pressure. So I was, I was proud of myself that I didn't cave to the pressure and go back to my old ways. On the other hand, the other feeling I have when I see this is um, that I'm so much better now, especially with the head shaking. Now you notice the head is shaking a lot. Well, that's not what makes the front quintet last movement exciting, right? So if you close your eyes, you don't hear the excitement if somebody's sh shaking their head. So I would urge you guys already now to start separating out your playing from your body. In other words, if your hips are shaking, that's not what makes the music exciting. If your head is turning, that's also not what's making the music happen. Ask yourself, what else could you be doing besides using your body parts? Well, what makes the front exciting is the rhythm. You can think about the sounding point. You could think about the angle of the bow, where it is on the instrument, how fast the bow is going if you want to play exciting. Uh, what I would call internal dynamics. If you want something to sound more exciting, make little waves, little hairpins, um, you know, rush and take time. Timing is a huge thing when it comes to, to excitement. So try to separate those things out because when you go to a concert and you see somebody like jumping around on stage and then you close your eyes and you don't hear any of that passion, that's a problem. <laughs> so try to already think about this now, it will, it will probably prevent you from getting into trouble later. And so what I said before, uh, you get what you train for. Uh, it's pretty much exactly what Pam's saying. The way you play is the way you have practiced. So here's a great little uh, talk from Pam. So practice scales in the way that you would practice phrases because Practicing technique separate from music, I really don't believe in. Because I think if you practice, the way you play is the way you have practiced. If you've practiced mechanically, you'll play mechanically. If you treat a scale like a great melody, when it shows up in the Beethoven concerto, it will be a great melody. Well, I'm sure that you can, you can see that we're talking about the same things, but from two different standpoints. His is from the physical standpoint and mine is from a musical. I mean, it's the same principle. Uh, you know, you don't, you can't expect to go out on stage like an artist if you haven't practiced like an artist, right? You can't expect to f have your body feel good at the end of the day when you've done only stupid things to make it feel bad. So this would save everybody a lot of practice time if they already practice with a thousand percent expression at home, right? Give it your all, get, get nervous, give it your adrenaline, with total put all your emotions into the practicing so that the only difference will be that there is happily an audience to play for. If you practice with your mind somewhere else or the TV on, or you're just moving your hands, you're wasting time and you will probably get more nervous when you walk on stage because you haven't trained what it feels like to really play. Nobody practices with the TV on, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew somebody that did actually. <laughs> um, okay, preventative measures. 
Well, so there's a lot you can do. I mean, I think that the moral of today's story is that to identify a, a problem is the first step, right? That's what we said at the beginning. That's what Howard said at the beginning. So the problem is that we all ignore aches and pains. And Howard always says an ache will become a pain if you don't take care of it and a pain will become an injury. So prevention is key. The sooner you can tune into a, a feeling that doesn't feel right, the sooner you can talk to somebody about it. Please, please, please talk to your parents, talk to your teachers, talk to your mentors, talk to your friends and get help. Because if you don't get help soon, it might take years like it took me. If I had maybe addressed my problems earlier in life and got help, I might've been fine in three weeks instead of three years. So that's the first step, really important. Warm up is another thing. I know everybody like warms up, you know, fast scales and loud and all of that, but these are your extremities. Um, it's important to get your body warm. And the way to get your body warm is to get blood flow from the heart. So if you can do jumping jacks or run up and down the stairs, that will be much better. You'll be much less prone to injury if your hands are warm. Um, carrying, well, this was a huge thing that I also had to change. I used to carry around a lot of stuff. I used to have a heavy case. I now have a uh, $40 cheap cardboard case for a really nice instrument <laughs> um, because it's the lightest one on the market. It doesn't mean you're going to carry it. It's, it's not going to be less safe because you're going to carry it with care no matter what, right? So choose the lightest case. Do not stuff it with books, music, anything that you don't need, right? I always say if, you, if you're not playing all 10 Beethoven sonatas tonight, do not bring the whole volume. Just photocopy what you need for that day, not what you might need in, later in your life. So the, the, the case is not a storage locker, okay? The other thing about carrying bags and stuff, um, backpacks, you always say, is better than shoulder, right? Uh, not necessarily. No, they, no, either could be good. But if you're going to use the backpack, make sure it's close to your body. Don't let it hang away from you or too low. And so you can put your fingers in the straps and hold it out in front of you like that or cross and pull the straps this way. That way it takes a little pressure off of your shoulders. That goes for backpack cases also, and especially cellists. But if you do, if you're, if you have a, a shoulder bag or a shoulder case, just alternate shoulders. Don't get stuck in one position for too long. And as far as like the handbag and stuff in your bag, I mean, I look at my friends' bags and it's like, you know, they're carrying books that they might read, you know, next year just what you need, just what you need. So I had to learn how to have just a fanny pack. And Howard used to say, if it doesn't fit in your fanny pack, you don't need it today. So the miniature small things like in the travel section at the drugstore is what you need. Like the smallest, the smallest amount of stuff in the center of your body is the safest way to carry things. Avoiding standing static with your instrument. You catch cellists all the time, right? Yeah. Now, if, you, if you're carrying a cello and you're standing there for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes talking to a friend, that's, that's a lot of downward stress on the neck and shoulders. So I, I suggest if you're talking more than 30 seconds to a minute, take it off your body and then stand and talk. And that's not just for cellists. That's for all of us. Just put your, put your instruments down, put them between your legs, and that way they'll be safe. Now, uh, learning a piece of music with the score before you even take out your instrument will make you a better musician. It will save time in your practicing and it will save your body. So this is a huge preventative measure that has a musical benefit. I call this the way uh, the, the hourglass method, as you can see, it's sort of like an hourglass. And the idea is to start big with the score. Now, what I mean by starting big is find out everything you can about the composer, find out what else was going on in history for the context, what else was going on in the composer's life that might have influenced the way he wrote this piece. Do not listen to recordings. You're just gonna imitate somebody else's possibly bad playing. And I include myself in that. Uh, learn with your eyes and learn the bigger picture why a piece was written. Then when you look at the score, look for everything, rhythm, melody, harmony, 
timing, meter, dynamics. You can get a lot of ideas just by looking at the score, especially uh, voicing, like what is your role? You know, if, if you see that you're an accompanist and you have a lot of passages, like let's say in the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, there's a lot of black notes, right? But if you don't look in the score, you think all those notes are really important and should be heard. So if you start by learning the score, you see that, oh, actually somebody else has a melody right now. I'm supposed to be out of the way. That will totally reduce the amount of time you practice a passage and you'll play it differently. You won't have to undo it later. Um, so all these things are really, any observation you can will lead to an idea. All your observations could lead to an idea about your sound, about where the, what string to be on, what kind of vibrato, what kind of articulation, even what slides, what fingerings, you can get all these ideas just by looking. I would suggest you use colored pencils and you use a different color for each element of music, melody, harmony, rhythm, texture, timing, meter, dynamics, just like, you know, one from every food group. Then you start, you just by doing this, you'll, your playing will already improve. The middle of the hourglass is when you finally get to practice your ideas. And this quote, learn the notes last, is from my beloved father, Claude Frank. He was a great pianist who used to say, learn the notes last, learn the ideas first, because 99% of piano playing is knowing what notes to eliminate, right? There's a lot of notes. And if you've practiced them too loud to begin with, you'll just have to undo that, as I said. So that's the fun part is practicing the details. And then you put it back together. And as I said before, try to play with a thousand percent expression when you're trying anything. Play a chunk, play a section, play a movement, play a whole piece. And by the time you get to the performance, you'll be able to sort of what I say, sight read with knowledge. You'll be able to put it all together, but you have a lot of knowledge from the top of that hourglass. As for when, what happens when you actually practice? Okay, now I've always, I've never really practiced more than two hours in a day, um, but it's because I like doing other things. So I make sure that I do really honest practicing. I think less is more. If you put a boundary around your practicing, it forces you to choose only what doesn't work. Please do not waste time practicing what already sounds good. I know it feels good to do that and it's important for your ego to, to sound good, but it is a waste of time. <laughs> so honesty is really, really key um, to identify what doesn't work and only practice that. I used to spy on my friends practicing, you know, the girl with the great sound, she's practicing her tone. The guy with the great intonation, he's practicing scales. And I just thought that is a huge waste of time. It's also a waste of your hands. Um, so the way you play is the way you have practiced. Whatever you play, make sure, even if you're trying to just um, get something accurate, that it has musical expression. Because you, don't set, you can't separate accuracy from, from expression. You have to do both at the same time. That's another tremendous time saver. And the most important thing is never repeat anything without changing something. I hear this all the time in my students and my friends. Something doesn't work, they play it immediately again. Please, that's not how to fix something. You're just repeating what doesn't work. So it's, it's a waste of time and your hands. It's also could lead to um, repetitive stress injury if you just keep repeating what doesn't work. So less time is gonna force concentration. I would suggest that whatever you, let's say you practice two hours in a day, separate it out. Do, a sh do 40 minutes in the morning, 40 minutes in the afternoon and the rest in the, in the evening if you can or separate it in two because nobody's concentration can last that long. I cannot concentrate and actually improve my playing. I cannot concentrate for more than maybe 40, 50 minutes max. Um, so, and building in breaks is a really important thing. Can you talk a little bit about what should happen on breaks and how to make sure that they happen? Uh, you should take a break before you lose concentration, before you get bored, before you start getting symptoms. So that, that's when you get sloppy and that's when injuries can start to occur. So on the breaks, 
you simply want to do something the opposite of playing, which could just be walking around, raising your arms, uh, movement, but not bringing your head down onto your phone, as I said before. <laughs> and we also, we all get very absorbed in what we're doing. We lose track of time. So Howard highly recommends a timer for everybody because you'll just forget what time it is. So put a timer on and stick to it. And that includes sitting at the computer. Um, and then a short list of problems in your practice is gonna be much easier to actually accomplish and you'll actually feel better about yourselves than a long laundry list of things that you didn't actually get done. So the trick to making it short is to be able to prioritize it. You know, not everything is equally a problem, even if you think it is. So make sure you just choose like your top three things that feel the worst and just attack those because you'll feel better about yourselves in the end. The other way to save time and your hands is what I call the three chance rule. I only give myself three chances to fix any problem. And that probably will make you very nervous even just thinking about it. And that is good because on stage, you have one chance to play something. You don't have the option to repeat it a hundred times until you get it right. So when you when the trick to, to doing this is think more and play less. Save your body by using your brain. So just like Howard said, to identify a problem in your body, the first step is to identify a problem on the page. Now, when I say to a student, okay, tell me what you didn't like, and she points to the whole page, I say, that's ridiculous. Tell me what line, what measure, what beat. That's what you guys should do to narrow it down to the smallest amount of music that could have a problem. That's the first thing. And then before you play, just guess what is the problem? If it's intonation, thank goodness there's only two chance, two, you have um, two options, sharp or flat, right? So just guess if the problem is on measure three, beat four, is the note higher, high or low? Guess ahead of time so that you don't waste a chance playing, repeating the problem. Is the problem the sound? Is the problem the phrasing? Is the problem the articulation? Spend a lot more mental time, mental time rather than playing. Then the first time is you play it and you put the instrument down. You don't repeat. You just play once and you listen really hard while you're playing and then you say out loud, what was the problem? The second chance, you're gonna say out loud how to correct it. You play it, you put the instrument down. Were you right? I would recommend that you guys overcorrect rather than undercorrect because nobody usually does that. <laughs> it's easier to come back to what's closer to you afterwards. The third time is to either correct the correction or to confirm that number two, your second chance was good. And that is it. If you can't fix something like this, you're not concentrating. I recommend that you do this for a sh very short amount of time. It's hard on the brain but it's gonna, and you're gonna hate me for like a week. And then next week you're gonna love me because your playing will have improved and you will have spent much less time. Another preventative measure is hands separate. In other words, in the, you know, a mirror is always the best thing you can do, either mirror or videotape so you can actually see what you're doing. But I always say, if you can't see the music in your hands, it's not happening. So a way to do that is Practice a passage just with the bow, open strings, and see is your bow doing what you want it to be doing to make the music happen. Then just do the left hand uh, with vibrato first, just to see, does that look like the music? If you separate the hands, you're separating your brain out also, which is very good. And no vibrato is an excellent way of practicing. Why don't you say a little bit about that? Uh, Peter Wiley once told me that if there was one thing he would do differently uh, in his career would, would have been to play practice much more without vibrato so that he could preserve his hand and his arm and also hear the music more purely. Yeah, you know, the, I think that uh, you should be able to play as beautifully as possible without vibrato because vibrato does not make a sound. The, the right hand makes the sound, the bow makes the sound, the vibrato just adds the color. And so many people 
have so much tension in their left hand, I think for that reason, that they think that they're making the sound with the left hand. Uh, we sort of talked about this already, but um, it's really crucial that you have practiced with a thousand percent expression. Every time you pick up the instrument, you should be saying something. Um, your body will be different if you're playing with expression or if you're playing passively. So please never play one note passively without full musical engagement. Simulating the environment is something that I do um, to, to include nerves in what I'm doing. In other words, at home, if I'm in my jeans and you know, relaxed, I am not going to be simulating an environment. So what I do when I, I, I never wear pantyhose. So if I wear pantyhose, I know that it's concert time. So at home, I put on pantyhose to make myself nervous. I'll put on the dress that I have to play uh, with. I put on the shoes. I'll turn out the lights, put a spotlight. I'll either have somebody to play for or put my stuffed animals out to simulate an audience being there. I get cold, my hands get cold. So rather than trying to make them really warm, which I know won't actually happen, I put them under cold water because I know myself, I know what will happen to me on stage. And I wanna try that out at home. Um, including nerves is a really important thing. We are in the arts. We are not brain surgeons, right? Nothing bad will happen to us if we make mistakes. And nerves are good. Nerves, uh, Howard, you always say, what do you say about nerves? It means you care. It means you care. It means you're alive, right? And nerves can mean adrenaline, right? That means you're excited. So try to make yourself nervous at home. It, it can only help your playing. Um, and then when you're at home and on stage anytime, take risks, decide, give yourself permission to make mistakes because for the same reasons I said, but because also there's no reward if there's no risk, you know, take a chance, nothing terrible will happen to you. I, I try to make my mistakes like in the first measure, first line of something, you know, just get it over with. And then I realize that the world keeps turning and then I can enjoy myself. So nothing bad will happen to you with mistakes, but it's also a physical thing. It's a way of um, protecting your body because there's a sports analogy here. Yeah, you know, I'm just. Well, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, embr embracing risk as one of the exciting and positive parts of playing, and you'll be less prone to missing because if you're fearful of missing, you get too tight often. Um, so don't think about playing perfectly. Uh, you know, it's uh, you you want to go. It's more fun if you go for some risks. But also when you try to control what you're doing, you get, you, you actually get more tight and more tense and you could actually become injured from that. So please let's just let go of the control and all have a little bit more fun. And that is all. So we welcome any questions. Can you get us maybe on the screen? Yeah. Let me take away the... Yeah, guys, we have about um, about four or five minutes here. We we're, we we have to send these guys off to uh, chamber music and and some other rehearsals. But any questions? You guys really <laughs> covered uh, a, a a great amount. And um, um, Pam, I have a question. Did did you find you know with two very famous um, uh, parents as a concert pianist, etc. Did they experience some of these issues um, in their day? They didn't have Howard, but uh... they didn't have Howard, but they they were no. I mean, I'm I'm so lucky to have had them as examples because uh, they really believed in a well-rounded life. Uh, they didn't practice a lot of hours. They practiced incredibly focused when they practiced but they were also very well-read, well-cultured. They liked to do a lot of other things. So they had a, a very full life uh, besides being at the piano. So neither of them ever were injured. And uh, that could be, they were just lucky, but I also think it's because they had a very varied lifestyle as Howard had mentioned. It, you know, Mark, if anybody has, questions later they could just write write them to us and we'll be happy to answer them also sure and we did we did share with everyone uh the, the website and the handouts and uh you know we tried to um, have everybody as, as well prepared as possible so 
you really, um, I think you really filled in a lot of uh, blanks that might have been there. But this was, um, you know, this is this is one of my favorites because I, I just remember now at least we have them right here in front of us. So um, would you all join me in thanking Mr. Mr. Nelson and Ms. Pine? Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And thank you, Mark, for letting us do this because it, it gives us so much pleasure, really. And we remember the class from three years ago. Um, we loved it then and we loved it again now. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. This is a gift to, to all of us. And You're will you be Philly on Saturday? Stop in. Oh, oh, yes. You're, you're performing in Philly next week. Is that correct? No, I'm not. Actually, oh. I I have had long COVID for a year. Whoa. And I have been housebound for a year. And this is now I can come clean. This is my first um, Zoom presentation in over a year. And I'm so excited that I feel really well enough to do it. So I'm really doubly grateful for to you for asking. Well, well we're, we're, we are really thankful as well. And, and, and um, you know, thank you for, for sharing that because, you know, we all go through things and it's good to know that famous people and, 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 and people who we look up to also have worked through these, not just with your physical issues, but also with um, your situation with COVID and wish you all the best health. And we do really, um, if, if you're, if you're going to be in Philly for any time, particularly on a Saturday, we'd love you to stop by as, as Chuck said. So thank you once again, we're going to send everybody off to their other rehearsals and release you. Thanks again. Thank you. See you thank soon. You I hope. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Everyone have a great week and uh, practice some of these uh, techniques. <laughs> Chuck, can I say hi to you again? I only see half Chuck? of you. Uh, oh, Pam, Pam was asking, can she say hi? Oh, here I am. <laughs> All right. Good. Oh, wait. wait where did I go? Now, there you 